I've come in today to kind of give an update for um, the intersection of our world and bone health, the bonehead world as we like to refer to ourselves, and um, the world of um, spine surgery and complex spine cases. I really have two goals in the time that we have, and we'll go about 20 minutes and then we'll have time for questions. Um, I wanted to update where we're at in terms of the intersection of bone health treatment and uh, hopefully helping you all with the success not only of your operations, but with the success of patient spines moving forward after their operations, because I'm, uh, we're just as concerned about what happens to these patients um, after they recover from their fusion and the complications that can ensue with compression fractures, et cetera, as time goes on. And then talk a little bit about a technology that um, I think will be quite beneficial that I think we're finally gonna start getting rolling here at Swedish, and that is a, uh, uh, a CT-based bone density and strength modeling software that um, we're going to have access to um, fairly certain in the next few months. I want to start with a case. This is a, a lovely woman who came to see me back about a year and a half ago, 61 years old, a um, little bit of a thing, um, with uh, spinal anesthesis, leg pain, spinal stenosis. She had been, had a long course of non-operative treatment. She was managed through a pain center on the east side and got referred to me after an updated densitometry. Long smoking history, but fortunately had quit. Unfortunately, also for her, she had uh, and still has um, anorexia in remission. So she struggles with anorexia, had lost a lot of menstrual cycles, and on that basis had had very low bone density. Also ended up with two compression fractures before age 60. Um, she had taken bisphosphonates in the past uh, for a decent course, had a break, and um, she came to see me, and I said, I'd really like to start you on anabolic treatment with teriparatide um, anabolic recombinant PTH. And uh, she said, okay. She took it for a month, and unfortunately, her pre-existing anxiety got really bad, although I'd never encountered that before. We stopped her medication. She worked with her psychiatrist. She's very um, uh, compliant, so it's just a lovely thing to, to work with her. Um, her leg pain and back were ultimately bad enough that she sought out some opinions for surgery. And um, she ultimately ended up down at USCF, uh, UCSF, and, and um, was recommended L3 to L5 fusion. Um, she uh, then came back to see me and said, you know, they're requiring me to go back on my Forteo before I have my surgery. Uh, they want me on Forteo for three months and I'm really scared because I was so anxious on the medication. So we um, actually just restarted it recently and, and gingerly. And her surgery is actually scheduled, I think, for next week at UCSF. And, and she's doing quite well. But I bring up this case because it's not typical. Um, it's becoming more typical, fortunately, as we see patients from, from, uh, th from the spine service. I think the first thing that's not typical about this case is this is a woman who has bad bone, um, clearly. And she was referred for bone health evaluation. And, and I think that's really important. Um, in my world, I don't really need much more data than I already have to know that she's got a problem with her bone strength. She's got vertebral compression fractures. Those are de facto evidence of skeletal fragility, and they mean more than just having a low bone density alone. They mean their bone quality is compromised, and uh, the, the anabolic effect of teriparatide, and I'll talk about teriparatide in a minute, um, not only helps restore bone mass, but also bone microarchitecture and quality. And, and probably has some important functions beyond simply putting more, you know, keeping more calcium in bones. The third thing, as I said, that's not typical is that UCSF basically told her she needed to be on Forteo and she needed to go, come back and see me to restart it any way that she could. And she wanted to do that because she wanted to have the best outcome. Her sister had also had uh, a back surgery at UCSF. And the other thing that's not typical about this case is we were fortunate to be able to get bone density data on her um, because, uh, as you know, most of these patients have lots of degenerative disease. That's why they're getting ready for an operation anyway. And um, our bone density machines just don't do a real good job um, when we have degenerative disease. We're led astray by falsely elevated bone density measurements. And sometimes uh, we have sub suboptimal assessment because we're relying on non-local bone density at the, the uh, hip or the forearm. Um, so this, the first thing, as I said, that's not typical is that they required her to, um, they, they literally said, go back to your doctor and get started on your Forteo again. Any way that you have, we need it three, for three months. So for those of you who aren't familiar with Forteo, Forteo is recombinant, 
parathyroid hormone 1 to 34, first 34 amino acids in the parathyroid uh, 84 amino acid chain. Um, it is very effective at improving bone density. It helps recreate microarchitecture. It's given once daily um, for osteoporosis. It's uh, recommended that it's not be used for more than two years. It does have a black box warning associated with uh, risk for osteosarcoma, which I won't go into in any detail, but happy to talk about um, afterwards if people have questions about that. Suffice it to say that we use it with impunity when we think we need it, even in patients who um, uh, off-label use coming here um, who have had previous radiation therapy. Um, I wouldn't use it in anyone who's ever had Paget's disease of bone or another unexplained elevation of alkaline phosphatase. But um, we use it um, when we think we need to use it, sometimes with the uh, uh, consent and uh, approval of, um, of oncologists as well. So there have been a number of papers re uh, relating the use of teriparatide to success in fusion. These are, none of these are patient-oriented outcomes. These are all disease-oriented outcomes. Um, this, uh, these data are in your literature, not necessarily ours, but increasingly your data, your literature, and this is becoming my literature, so I think that's kind of fun. Um, this is one study. There's actually a group um, in Japan that's published a number of papers on use of teriparatide. Um, this study is about 60 postmenopausal women who had a one to two level fusion um, randomized to teriparatide uh, once daily or common oral bisphosphonate that's been around for 15 or so years called resedronate. Um, the meds were started, and I think this is important in a theme that we see a couple of months prior to surgery um, and continued for uh, eight months. I'm not sure why those values were chosen, but, but they're pretty close to a year. So think about three months pre-use and nine months post-use, I think, is a good way to think of it. Um, fusion rates were uh, higher, however they're defined, and I'm not sh sure I remember how they're defined in this paper. Um, higher in teriparatide than in resedronate patients, although um, uh, those are, I, I think, decent fusion rates, as far as I know from the literature. Um, and the time to fusion was shorter with teriparatide by about two months, however defined in this paper. And I think they defined it in terms, in CT terms. Um, and there was more symptom relief with patients who took teriparatide, but it was not statistically different, uh, different. And the conclusion from this particular paper that teriparatide showed higher bone fusion rates and faster fusion than resedronates. This is not placebo comparator. This is active comparator of uh, anti-resorptive treatment. This is actually the same um, cohort of patients with a couple more patients added for um, details about um, hardware loosening. Uh, and, um, and so it's now 62 patients, teriparatide and resedronate again. You can recognize two months prior and now continue for 10 months post-op, so a little bit more uh, longer follow-up. Incidence of pedicle screw loosening and teriparatide significantly lower than resedronate, and pedicle screw loosening with resedronate was not significantly different than the control group. And the conclusions here were that teriparatide, it was suggested that teriparatide increased the quality of the lumbar spine pedicle bone. Whenever I see that quality of bone thing, I think that's a bit of a reach. Sometimes I'd rather see these papers being more descriptive about the actual findings and that make these leaps because we know that there are basically three factors in quality, or at least that's the way I think of them, and probably many characteristics that contribute to quality, uh, microarchitecture, material properties, and uh, uh, essentially anatomic properties of local bone. And, um, and, and I'd, I'd rather see these data be more specific, but be that as it may, they do refer to it as quality improvement. This is a paper um, in, in your world, so to speak, showing improvement in insertional torque uh, of pedicle screws. Um, you know, similar uh, kind of approach. Uh, this is teriparatide versus none. So this is uh, a routine care otherwise, um, and just 30 patients, 29. Um, and the conclusion is teriparatide beginning at least one month prior to surgery was effective in increasing the insertional torque of pedicle screws during surgery in patients with postmenopausal osteoporosis. So um, a, a number of papers with this particular agent showing improvement in disease-oriented outcomes. None of these data go beyond one year that I've seen. Um, so, so some very, I think, encouraging results from the use of this daily self-injected, very expensive medication. Uh, so uh, a little bit of a summary, improved pedicle screw purchase with teriparatide uh, lessens the chance of, there's a, the typo that I fixed in the, uh, 
sorry about that, in the, in the most up-to-date version, speeding up fusion, acting relatively quickly. And I think um, this is my addition from a slide that I received from, from the Lilly people. Um, I think two to three months prior is ideal, if possible, in, in these patients, of course, bearing in mind the urgency of the need for the operation. We can't, we couldn't measure a T-score, and I'll get to that in a second, Rod. There's a CT might be a, a better way to understand changes in strength, and we do see rapid changes in measured compressive strength in vertebral bodies within three months. Isn't one of the problems with that period of using the hip and using all this old data? So. It, it is a problem. Local bone density with densitometer best predicts at least fracture risk in our world. And, uh, and, and so when we have, uh, when we're hampered by not being able to obtain good data from at least the lumbar spine, it may not even help you as much in the thoracic spine, for instance, right? We always see patients who have like normal T-scores and they have like five compression fractures in their spine. Is that something that they can actually get tested and have a Yeah, it, it is a problem, and I think this is where the, this, this new Virtuos technology that I'll get to in just a second will be very helpful. So, so um, let me just move down, and then we can talk about that a little more. But yeah, it's very common to see this, this not only <coughs> the bone density just not be reliable there, the clinical manifestations are clear. Um, and, and I think it's less common, particularly in a postmenopausal female age group, to see bone density at the hip that's completely normal. But um, you do see it. Uh, and, 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 and so what do you do? What do I do? I think the biggest concern there is if I'm trying to sell teriparatide to an insurance company. Well, that's my point. Yeah. You know, so you can't get them a prescription as they're saying that they're not. It, it becomes very it's difficult. Right, right. They, right. Mean, they have five compression fractures. You know, yeah. Five times. Yeah. And, and usually we can win the day yeah. um, with, a, with, with a letter and a talking to. Yeah. But sometimes we can't. Um, and this is just another um, uh, uh, summary slide. Uh, the dosage of teriparatide is 20 milligrams a day injected subcutaneously. I think uh, initiating two, one to three months prior to, to fusion is helpful. And then in these patients who are at risk, uh, particularly for adjacent segment breakdown, compression fractures, um, you know, uh, I, I would like to continue these patients through the full course of Forteo. Um, and, and that's usually not a problem because when we get approval from a, from a uh, insurance company, we're getting approved for a course of treatment, and that's usually a two-year course. So the, here's to answer your question, Rod. This is some, some data that's unpublished. Uh, it was published in the abstract at JBM, uh, ASBMR a couple of years back um, from Tony Kiveny's group. And these are postmenopausal women who were followed with every three-month uh, quantitative CT um, at the spine and the hip, um, trying to point out that the bone strength changes um, that we can't see because of precision and other problems with bone density machines are quite evident on CT scan uh, very quickly. So it, uh, this, the graph of the spine there says 20 postmenopausal women who were treated with Forteo. For three months, they had QCT done and compressive strength modeled for, from finite element analysis um, at the L1 vertebral body. And what you see is the compressive strength um, in the upper graph changing very rapidly over the course of three months, compressive strength improves by uh, about 12%. And over the course of one year of therapy, the compressive strength at L1 improves by 30%. Um, and so very rapid changes. We, we rely on this aspect of teriparatide to um, help us in reassuring the patient that um, their bones are getting stronger. Even though we might not be able to see it with bone density, um, we, we know that this happens. So I, I, I want to be sure that we that we remember that teriparatide is probably not the only treatment that works for patients uh, who, who may require bone strengthening to help with fusion. Uh, this is a study that I'll just go through briefly. It's uh, um, about 70 patients who completed the study um, were randomized to another agent, a bisphosphonate, a very long-acting bisphosphonate called zoledronic acid, which we use as a brand name called Reclast, and which the oncologists have used for many years as the medication called Zometa that you may know. We use a five milligram dose once a year. The patients in this study were given five milligrams once uh, on post-operative day three. 
um, despite some concerns about um, healing that orthopedists have with fractures and giving this medication early. Uh, this, uh, this trial was done uh, in the hospital, essentially, which I think is a great place to do treatment if you can um, deal with the DRG. Um, and then bone formation was assessed from CT at uh, 3, 6, 9, and 12 months. Hardware was assessed with x-ray. And uh, basically, um, the results here are that there was more high-grade fusion in the patients who received, excuse me, more high-grade bone formation in the patients that received zolantronic acid at 3, 6, and 9 months but not at 12 months. And solid fusion, that's the combination of CT and X-ray um, findings, was achieved in 82% of the zoledronic patients and 83% of placebo, so no difference there. Interesting, on the right, the ODI scores were significantly different, better in the zol patients than in the placebo patients at 12 months. This is the first study that I've seen that's had functional outcomes at 12 months, so I think that's an interesting part of this study. And then, um, it, although the study is empowered to really understand the difference, uh, no patients who got, plus, who got zolendronic acid had compression fractures in the first year. And to Rod's point, six patients who got placebo had compression fractures in the first year. And the second thing that's not typical about this case is that we had reliable bone densitometry. And, uh, and as I said, that's problematic uh, all along for patients with degenerative diseases of the spine. So some of the differences between bone density measurement and quantitative CT, which is where uh, this talk will end up, uh, are seen here. Uh, you know, CT is very rapid, has an extremely low dose, um, no prep for the patient, doesn't require a super expensive machine. A bone density scanner is now about $50,000, and I don't know what a CT scanner goes for. Uh, the techs are paid about half of what the CT techs are. Um, some of the technical details are that bone density machines are calibrated very regularly. In fact, our machine is calibrated internally with every scan and externally once a day. Uh, CT scans uh, do get calibrated, but I don't know that they're calibrated as routinely. Uh, if some, maybe some of the radiology people can help me on that. Um, and sorry, can I interrupt there? Yeah, right, this is so important. Is the T score derived from the? Uh, uh, DEXA scan at an absolute level, or is this different from machine to machine? It is different from machine to machine, right. The intent of the T-score ENS was to uh, harmonize the ability to compare bone densities across machines, um, and it was really meant to do that back in the early 1990s for research purposes. It has not turned out, in point of fact, to be able to do that for a couple of reasons. One is that the machines are proprietary. They have proprietary software to detect bone edges and algorithms. They have proprietary databases that relate to T-scores, the only uniform databases for the femoral neck measurement. Um, and uh, and, and the, even though they use the same basic technology, the details of internal calibration, et cetera, those are all very different. So a T-score is not a T-score is not a T-score. And what is the approximate error range or interpretation range that you so well? It, uh, there, there isn't one. The, cl the closest that, that we can come is with the femoral neck because that is a uniform database. Um, the error ranges are anywhere at the femoral neck between 1% and 7% in terms of absolute bone density. So, uh, but in our world, when we're talking about a 3% change in bone density being significant, that's way too big. So, yeah, it is a problem. Yeah, and it's not going to be resolved. It just will never be resolved. Okay, so I'm going to move on in the interest of time. Um, so what, what we're looking at now to, to help overcome some of these data and provide, I think, better information for these patients is CT-based bone density measurement um, that can be done on the fly uh, and from old CT scans. So there is Hounsfield unit-based bone density that's has, that can be done on scanners with appropriate software, but a phantom needs to be used at the time of the scan. That has been an ongoing problem, and then calibration of the machines on an ongoing basis is important. What this technology allows to do, and I remember the first time I told Jens about this, he was like, <laughs> was that these scans, you can, you can, for instance, take a CT of the abdomen that was done for um, aortic aneurysm. There are lumbar bones in that CT. There is also intraperitoneal fat, blood, and air around the patient. Those are the calibration mechanisms for the CT. And, uh, and so the, the, the bone density measurement can be very well calibrated uh, from patient to patient without using a phantom. So uh, one, of the, one of the boons of this is to be able to send the bits to this uh, firm at UCSF and get them to send us back data on compressive strength and bone density. 
And uh, this Virtuos technology is now on the way here at Swedish. We had a bit of a, 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 a false start last year, and I think, uh, I think it's going to happen probably in the next six months. And it, we're just going to use it. We had thought about a, a licensing um, uh, model for this. We're going to use their standard drag and drop model. So we will drop the DICOM file on their secure icon. And the next morning, we'll get our report back. Um, so this is the technology called Virtuos. The report you can see on the left, probably not the, too much detail for you. But the FDA approved software since 2014. We send the DICOM files to them. As I said, no simultaneous calibration necessary. You may be able to see. Uh, probably can't, but there is a region of interest, an elliptical region of interest inside the vertebral body here that completely avoids the posterior elements, gives us trabecular BMD that is extremely well correlated to uh, BMD in DEXA. It also correlates to fracture risk extremely well, so well that the Bone Density Society says we can use this as a de facto diagnosis um, method. And uh, it also avoids the cortical bone uh, my little arrow's gone, the cortical bone. So it's an intratrabecular elliptical region of interest inside L1 and or L2 for bone density. We also can do finite element analysis modeling, and I think that's the really cool thing about this. I'll show you in just a second. And um, as I said, the present model will be that we will just drag the data to an icon and get a report back the next and day. Isn't it true? I mean, that's, we got two more things. My understanding is that the way they measure bone mineral No. Yeah. Yeah. And, and yeah, you know, moving towards finally being able to do it. The, the, and, it, and it's true. So you're, you're, what you're getting at is, is the bone composition, the bone, the, the proportion of cortical and trabecular bone in the hip, in the regions of the hip rod. So the total hip, which is essentially the upper sixth of the femur, is 50% uh, cortical, 50% trabecular. The femoral neck measurement, which is that little rectangular box you see right here, is about 70-30. There's a fair amount of cortical buttressing in this area. You can see on the image the cortex there, but it's 70-30 trabecular. And of course, um, intratrabecular is 100% trabecular. When we do bone density with DEXA, we're getting about 85% trabecular, 15% uh, cortical. The, 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 the cortex in the posterior elements and the cortex in the uh, vertebral bodies don't add much to the bone density. So I get exactly where you're coming from. And to, to your point about the, uh, you know, the common sort of uh, scenario, yeah, I think the most common place to see that is in postmenopausal women. In the 50 to 60 range, 65, women lose bone at the spine first. And so you tend to see the hip lag behind. So it would be a really common phenomenon to see that in that age group. But one more point from mine to, to Rod's excellent uh, observation. Most commonly, this is why we try to usually not get spine measurements. In the spines that we send for evaluation, they have uh, secondary osteophytosis, especially the older adult progenitive scolies. So uh, the false positive, false negative, so you want to see that rates are way higher in those spines. Agreed. And so that's one of the beauties of just bypassing the, the posterior elements and the degenerative changes and just seeing what the trabecular BMD is like. So um, as I said, not, those are the, there are the um, regions of interest obtained from the CT-based on the left. The, that's a better shot now of the ellipse inside a vertebral body and the femoral neck measurement plus the total hip measurement from CT in this technology. So it can also strength model at the hip, more important for us than for you guys. Then the uh, images that you see um, to the right are the finite element analysis uh, at hip and spine in static view of the compressive loads that are modeled on the hip with the resulting um, areas of uh, high stress and deformity to failure. So where you see red in those areas on the right, both of the hip and the spine, that's deformity to failure. And, um, and basically what the technology allows is to, to take 
um, small slices of a vertebral body in this circumstance um, and model small voxel uh, material properties, uh, one millimeter, these are one millimeter voxels inside the vertebral body, and then use finite element analysis to see what happens to the vertebral body during def deformation. There's a threshold that's been established um, at about 4,500 newtons of yield force, um, which I looked it up, that's actually quite a bit of force for a vertebral body when you think of such a small size um, there. Um, and that is considered the fragility threshold, and you'll see that in the next, uh, in the next set of graphs. So we'll just concentrate on vertebral strength at the right. You can see the red line there is uh, modeled as the fragility threshold. These are just postmenopausal women. These are actually data from Shane Birch's cohort at UCSF, um, that, the study with cherry parotide that uh, hasn't filled yet. Um, and uh, these, are, these are women from that study whose um, compressive forces are modeled through their uh, planning CT. And um, fully 30% of the women in that study um, are, um, had osteoporosis and or fragile bone strength. Um, this, was, this is also an all-comer study, so that's, that's important information to know. Um, so this is some, these are some of the things that this, this technology can do for us. And, and I'm hopeful that we'll be able to bring it uh, very soon. And then on the horizon for you all is um, surgical planning for screw placement. This is not my department, and I think it would be great sometime maybe if we get Tony to come up. He's very willing to come up. He's the, he's the primary scientist, at, um, and, and I think he could talk about this in depth with you all. Um, just modeling areas of stress with and without screws, with and without augmentation. Um, I think this requires a CT, excuse me, a, a digitally-based screw placement system. Um, and as I recall, last, last discussion, I don't think that's available here. So in summary, uh, many osteoporosis patients show benefits and aspects of fusion success, albeit in small studies. Uh, most of the data from teriparatide, but we do have data, as I said, from bisphosphonates as well, not just the zoledronic acid that I showed you, but also uh, essentially non-inferiority of alendronate and a resedronate study, that's another oral bisphosphonate, um, that shows improvement in certain parameters of fusion. But there are lots of practical constraints that exist for teriparatide. Not the least of them is getting the patient to self-inject every day for one to two years. The cost, which uh, the cash, cash price for 28 days of teriparatide is uh, $2,500. So uh, yeah, uh, a two-year course is a 50, 50 grand if you had to pay for it. Most people don't. We can find, um, we can find uh, uh, foundation assistance for lots of patients and make it relatively affordable. Um, there aren't any injection site reactions for, for most patients. Uh, they, they get good training for technique. So there are some practical constraints. And convincing them to take a shot every day um, for two years uh, is a, can be a little daunting. Uh, I, I think there's very limited data showing actual outcomes-oriented uh, stuff in terms of uh, at the patient level. And um, we've already discussed that there are challenges with traditional bone density assessment that I think the CT-based virtuosity assessment um, can help us overcome. And ultimately, that CT-based placement uh, technology may help us um, help you with uh, placement of screws um, and other hardware in the, in the future. So thank you, and I'm happy to take any more questions.